Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. We're David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. Today's show is going to be twice as good because we have twice as many guests. We have David Reznikoff and Don Stalter from GFC here. David is our uh, local GFC colleague in LA, and Don Stalter is the U.S. partner for GFC, responsible for all U.S. investments, as I understand it. GFC is Global Founders Capital, which is a $1.2 billion fund, but they write seed and pre-seed checks and then continue to invest in later rounds. David and Don, thanks for joining me. So let's start with David. Um, I'd love to hear from you some of the basics of GFC, what size checks you guys write, how many investments per year are you doing, and a little bit more about your follow-on investing strategy. Of course. So um, in terms of check size, I mean, you know, we will write checks anywhere and pre-seed rounds, you know, from 100K, you know, all the way through multi-million dollar checks, you know, um, as rounds progress. You know, so the idea is for us to back is like really, really strong entrepreneurs um, right when they're getting started. Uh, and then with the idea of investing in every round after that, you know, all the way through IPO, M&A, what have you. And, you know, we have no problem in, you know, leading multiple rounds in a row. I I think that's uh, one of the big things that's going to separate us from uh, other funds. So pausing on that, so most people, I mean, there are other life cycle investors, but usually if they do the A, if they lead the A, they won't lead the B. And that's why you're different. Unlike other funds, we don't have strict ownership targets for our initial investment. You know, we don't need to grab the 15, 20%, you know, whatever the, whatever, um, the target is up front. You know, our idea is to really build with the company. You know, um, we, we partner with a debt fund as well. So we really think of ourselves as sort of like the one-stop shop for startups when they want to work with us. Um, and, you know, we, we like to have a very much a working relationship uh, with the companies we back around their capital needs. So just want to always have an open dialogue around like, hey, look, like, you know, if we you know, this many dollars invested can get us to the next step in the life cycle, you know, that's really the conversation we want to have with entrepreneurs. Got it. It's like when we were talking with Graycroft, Graycroft says that for under a million dollar check, they don't need to go to their investment committee, which I thought was interesting. Do you guys have, so David, if you get excited about a deal, do you immediately rope in Don? Do you guys rope in other people at GFC? Or how does your sort of, how does the process work if I'm an entrepreneur approaching you for a, an early, early round? Yeah, you know, I think one of the unique things about GFC is just the level, uh, just how entrepreneurial we are as a fund. Um, and I think, uh, you know, very much, I guess, just empowering everybody to really um, pursue the deals that they you know, that, that capture them. So I guess a typical process, you know, would be, you know, if I, if I meet an entrepreneur, uh, you know, have a few conversations with them, especially at the early stage, you know, we like to have multiple people from our team speak of the potential investment, um, you know, assuming, you know, everything is checking out, uh, then, then we'll loop in, Don will loop in, you know, other members of the organization at large, kind of get everybody together on a, on a final call and then come to a, come to a final decision. Yeah. I can kind of elaborate a little bit. Like I would say um, if the deal is kind of very, you know, vertical specific, if it's like a healthcare opportunity, for example, uh, we have a healthcare head now, uh, Sean, uh, based in San Francisco, um, or if the deals, you know, got an orientation towards France, for example, you know, we have members of our French team or Germany, for example, if it's a cross border deal, uh, we have now, we have a, you know, Israel partner. So, you know, we have, you know, geographical as well as vertical expertise. And how many people then, Don, are part of your team? Yeah, so on my team here in the U.S., we have uh, five folks, but we also have, you know, a roster of really awesome interns. How many partners, actually? I don't really know this. How many partners are at GFC? Yeah, so globally, you know, we have more than 10 partners. You know, we have partners across Europe. We have partners across Asia. We have partners in Latin America, Canada. You know, the business is, uh, is growing. It's really, really exciting. And I think, you know, the ambition is to be, able to look at a deal kind of, you know, in every, every corner of the galaxy. That, that's how I see it. That's great. And so if you're leading a deal, let's say in LA, for example, does someone have to pitch to all of the partners or does it go to you? And as David said, you're entrepreneurial, you get to be empowered to lead the deals in the US that you want to lead. And are you responsible for all the US? I said that, but then wasn't sure. No, no, we've got, well, so the way that it's set up is, you know, our partners, our partner in Israel, for example, if he finds an exciting opportunity in the U.S., you know, maybe it's something that we'll collaborate on, but effectively, like, he'll, you know, take a board seat, you know, um, folks from, you know, our French team or our German teams or teams like all over the world, like, you know, we, they can do deals kind of anywhere, which is very, very empowering. 
That's cool. And do you guys all come together or is it Oliver Samar? Does he run it? Do you, how do you kind of all stay coordinated? I guess. How do you, who do you talk to? We collaborate on almost a daily basis. We also have the opportunity, you know, to collaborate with our debt fund uh, on a daily basis. We can bring anyone, you know, we want into kind of the IC. You know, I think it's, um, it's, it's something where if we want to be strategic, we want to be thoughtful about making sure that the founder really understands us and the value that we can provide, then we'll, we'll host them um, with the people who, who can support the business. That's really it. And I think, you know, Oliver and, you know, the Samwares, they make themselves available sort of at any point in time, which is absolutely incredible. I'm super intrigued. I mean, I, uh, they are sort of larger than life characters in my brain, at least. You know, while we're an institutional fund, we very much act like an entrepreneurial fund where, you know, instead of being financial engineering oriented uh, organization, although we're capable of that, you know, we're not necessarily trying to kind of squeeze out every term or, you know, trying to optimize. Instead, we're trying to really support the founder every which way. And so if I'm looking to raise my early stage money, you guys will come in pre-product at times, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. There aren't that many people who say that. And then um, the idea is, do you think about your reserve strategy in the same way that someone else would? I mean, I think the opportunity to provide additional capital to a company, you know, in the, in the case of you know, need or in the case of you know, additional acceleration is there. We just want to you know, be able to support our companies and, and back up the truck when it, when it you know, needs to be the case. <laughs> and how many companies do you have in your portfolio now? That, and also, is this, are you investing right now at a fund one or fund two? I've forgotten. But you must have a lot of companies in your portfolio. Yeah, it's, it's, it, we, we're investing out of uh, one fund and you know, we've invested in, I want to say, I don't know, David, maybe 120 companies. I haven't really double clicked on that for a little while. We've been so busy. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think we're up to about 120 in the U.S. at this point. Wow, 120, and that's in this one fund. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe you explained this to me before, but is your one fund, is it, it's all one pool of capital. The one point something billion is one pool of capital that the Israeli people, you know. Yeah, everybody, all around the world, yeah. But the 120 companies are sort of in your, within your pool. Within our sort of pocket. I mean, ostensibly the way to think about it is like we're managing them. You know, we're, it's, we, you know, the, the, you bite off more than you can chew if you don't have kind of the right focus team, you know, for particular call it kind of portfolio. And I think we'd be very, very overwhelmed if we didn't have, you know, the team that we have in place to manage this portfolio. Yeah. I mean, I think I told you that my um, impression of David, sorry, David, but um, is that you're always on the, like, you're always moving. And I think if you've got 120 companies in your portfolio, it would explain it. Do you have any like words of wisdom for other uh, VC funds that are trying to manage huge portfolios? Because you guys must, you know, you have a, a large portfolio for a not huge team. I mean, the one thing I would say, and David, you know, let us know what you think, but you got to really, really, really love what you do. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's good. Totally. I was just talking with someone about burnout and I was saying burnout does not happen by working really hard. Burnout happens when you're working really hard and not loving what you're doing and getting frustrated. I think luckily we've backed some pretty awesome people that are just a really like just a ton of fun to work with. So, I mean, it's just fun at this point. Um, and, you know, as we, as you know, our portfolio matures, it's been, uh, it's been very rewarding just seeing the companies grow along with it. That's great. So in LA, David, you're now in LA, but I think you moved from the Bay Area. Is that a true statement? Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. So when I first joined GFC, uh, I was in the Bay Area with Don. And then uh, probably about May last year, something around like that, something around that, uh, moved down to LA. Got it. Great. And so you guys have a fairly, GFC has a fairly heavy LA presence, it feels like, because Sara is also in LA. You know, are there, for a large global fund, why spend so much time in LA? Yeah, you know, I mean, LA is awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so one LA is just an amazing place to be. But um, no, dude, I think, you know, we're, we're very much making an, a bet on LA as an ecosystem. And then also it's just very exciting to be able just to back companies that just have a competitive advantage because they are based in LA. You know, I mean, if you look at our portfolio, you know, something like the skills, which is like an e-learning platform, folks on athletics, you know, there's a heavy content piece to that. You know, it's a business that very much should be built in LA. 
uh, Mothership, which we're really excited about. You know, Last Mile Logistics very much should be in LA. Prima, that uh, sort of lifestyle brand, definitely should be in LA. Italic also should be in LA. Okay, so so your summary there is there are, you know, LA has one of the, what, the largest port in the US. So a huge need for logistics, amazing media presence. So there's some companies meant to be in LA. And yet, if you look at like absolute number of dollars or number of companies, LA is dwarfed still by the Bay Area. Do you think there's certain things that need to get going in LA? Where would you say the lever, the biggest levers are to really catalyze the LA ecosystem? You know, I think we're going to see it more and more given the amount of exits that have happened recently, large exits from LA companies. But I think just really getting that sort of underworld of angel and pre-seed financing really established is going to help a lot. You know, I mean, if you, if you spend time in the Bay, you know, you're just inundated with, you know, just everybody's an angel investor. Everybody's investing in their friends. You know, many, I'm sure you saw it coming out of Google, you know, somebody leaves Google and goes and starts something, you know, they get their friends at Google to invest in it, get them off the ground. You know, at least I haven't found, you know, that's happening in LA, at least to the degree it's happening in San Francisco yet. And so as that starts to change, uh, and it is changing, and as you know, tech becomes much, much more a part of the city, uh, I think we'll start to see that transition. Actually, maybe I'll just turn this to Don. Don, your background, um, you came in contact very early with the Samara brothers. Tell me about the history there. Yeah, like, okay, so I was working with a growth equity fund in London. I moved, I, I was in college in Berlin during, uh, while well, I was at the University of Chicago, and, I, and I, I learned German. I loved Europe. Through one of our managing partners, I uh, met uh, the Samware brothers in London. And uh, it turned out that you know, they were building a variety of different businesses. You know, sort of early days, I'm not entirely sure if it was Rocket Internet. I think it was just more scrappy entrepreneurs building amazing businesses and was brought in to help build a company called City Deal, uh, which we started in London and in Berlin. And, you know, effectively, it was a daily deal website, but there were a ton of those kind of at the time off the back of the success of Groupon and Living Social in the US. But even if you, you know, came to the US at that same time, like there are probably 20 or 30 kind of other similar businesses across California, New York, the Midwest, kind of everywhere. And so, you know, it was very, very opportunistic and very smart in terms of the timing. I kind of enjoyed the buy side, but literally this was right off the back of the financial crisis in 2008. And our pace of investing was not fast. And um, I wanted something fast and something, you know, I was in my you know, mid twenties and I wanted to just, you know, do something, knock something out of the park type story. And um, it was just like invigorating uh, to work with such great operators. And we, and this was you and one of the Samware brothers were starting it in the early days. Yes. And um, Chris Moore, who started auto one, which is like a large used car marketplace in Europe. Don, don't, don't forget. I know a lot about used car marketplaces. So <laughs> I know who he is. Oh, yeah, you do. You do. He's, he's an amazing guy. And, uh, and it was just like a roster of like amazing people. You know, what we ended up doing was, I mean, you can, it's all in the news and kind of public information, but we effectively was a roll up. You know, we worked with Groupon and then, you know, there are businesses across Europe and Italy and Spain in Eastern Europe uh, and then in Asia uh, where, you know, it was like, come in, let's figure out if it's the perfect fit. You know, let's streamline the business. Um, and let's turn this into a global sort of behemoth. And then at the same time, again, all, you know, in Business Insider, et cetera, uh, Living Social was uh, nipping at our heels, uh, to put it lightly. Aaron Battalion, uh, the CTO at the time, uh, is sort of constructing strategic angles on uh, taking over the universe with, with Living Social. It was almost like a fairy tale. It was kind of an amazing. It was a totally amazing experience. That's my reputation of Rocket Internet. And I, I think you were saying this is a little pre-Rocket days, but that they have this amazing ability to execute and amazing operators who just turn these businesses, you know, into these huge growth engines. Was a lot of that strategy, um, were a lot of those businesses roll up plays or were they operationally intensive? And did you get any like operational, you know, playbook handed to you? It was absolutely both. Um, I think the thinking process that sort of I subscribe to or sort of the playbook that I subscribe to was, around um, just really tracking metrics and KPIs from the very second that you start uh, something, the very second that you spin up an internal or an external function, meaning like you'll have time series data, you'll have data uh, to make key decisions uh, within 
you know, the first month, two months, three months that you're iterating on a business. And so you're making smarter decisions. And KPIs aren't just GMV and, you know, net revenue. And they're not just P&L. I mean, you can be creative around your KPIs. You can be creative around your OKRs. I mean, you were at Google Mini. So, I mean, like you've seen this, it's, it's, it, you, you can create a lot of ways to measure things. And How did you get that wheel spinning enough to actually have the metrics to measure? Yeah, I mean, we were super creative. Uh, one of the kind of funny stories back in the day, and uh, Chris can corroborate this, uh, is you know, we, when we stood up the website, uh, we wanted to kind of drive traffic to the website. And I remember uh, going out and taking 10,000 pounds out of the bank and you know, British pounds GBP and buying uh, Starbucks gift cards and then listing them on the website for uh, a fraction of the price that I actually paid. Chalk it up to marketing budget. But, you know, we acquired a lot of traffic and we managed to sell quite a few vouchers. So just saying, oh, we've got a deal with Starbucks. <laughs> Good strategy. I think we did. We accidentally did some of that at Shift, selling, you know, $10,000 cars for $9,000. <laughs> no, we're, not, we're giving people a discount, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, Got it. Okay. So you, you really got to know, um, you, you got to know the Samwars really closely then. And how related is GFC to Rocket Internet? Like it's got, I still, it still has Oliver still running GFC, right? Well, it's separate, but um, I would say if you look at, you know, Rocket Internet, it's a, it's a public uh, company that owns a variety of kind of e-commerce businesses and, and portions of those businesses, et cetera. I think, um, you know, we're a private capital fund. And, you know, we're exclusively focused on investing. You know, that said, like we have the resources of a rocket internet to help, you know, support the, the growth of, of businesses. There's no like rhyme or reason I, I would say to like, you know, conveyor belt out a business necessarily. Like we believe that everything should be done in a customized, curated kind of, you know, ad hoc fashion. I'm just like incredibly proud and excited to be part of this amazing team. And I think like we're a you know global family. And I think, you know, our goal is to be, like genuinely supportive and um, help people succeed because that's the most fun thing that you possibly do. Yeah, I agree with that. Thanks for saying that. And so David, let me bring you back into this. Like, how did you end up at GFC? How, what was your process like? How did you guys meet? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, you know, San Francisco tech scene story, I guess. But uh, so I was at a different fund for a couple of years uh, called Greenvisor Capital. Uh, so an early stage fintech fund in San Francisco. Um, and you just through sort of the, the San Francisco tech network. I actually met Don at a happy hour uh, one day. And I think, you know, it must have been probably six months that I knew him. Uh, we just ended up, you know, the same networking events, dinner parties, all those sorts of good things. And, you know, we got to the point where, I mean, I really enjoyed working with him. I mean, I think the, you know, the GFC way of investing, of, you know, you get an opportunity to look at just about any type of deal you could ever imagine uh, over, you know, you know, in any geo you could imagine. Uh, it was very cool. And then so uh, you know, the opportunity presented itself, uh, hopped over. That's great. And do you think like for you personally, do you, was there a learning curve from where you were um, in terms of are things done differently? You know, are you looking at different stage companies, anything like that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, I guess one of the big learning curves, um, and I think this just comes with time, is because we are so generalist, just trying to get, you know, internal benchmarks in my head around, like, if I'm looking at an e-com company versus a fintech company versus a SaaS company, you know, whatever the case may be, just kind of getting up to speed very quickly on, you know, what is a right sort of company for GFC? Can you share more on that? Because I think that is a challenge for entrepreneurs then also to know, yeah, if I'm an e-commerce company, what are the nuances that, that make it more of a GFC sort of company? So my feeling is, if we feel like we could work with the founder operationally day to day, then that's the business that we would probably want to invest in. And that sounds cookie cutter potentially, but that's genuinely how we feel. Yeah, I have the same feeling, but the feeling of who you want to work with, like I noticed at 10 on 10, we really like working with nerdy people or I do at least. When you say people you like to work with, do you have certain types you're like, yeah, this is a consistently good type. Like Ben Savage at Clocktire was like, he likes investing in associates from VC firms who've left to start companies. Like that's a, that's a persona he likes. Do you have any of those? Yeah, thought partner. I mean, I think like, like for us, it's just about, it's about alignment. Like do we feel it's someone that we could spend time with that we would enjoy working with? And I think nerdy founders, I think absolutely. I think, 
super friendly founders. Uh, absolutely. Like, you know, can you sell? Can you sell? Do you have charisma? Quantitative, you know, metrics driven founders. That gets us very excited. I think the one thing that I think is really important, especially in these tough times, is just resilience. And I think that's something that we, you know, sort of try to you know, really attribute to, to the founders that we're looking for right now. Like, how do you help build resilience, if you will? Because you said that was a key characteristic. And maybe some of it is talking and listening. I think it kind of is because we're, we're out in the world of investors all day long. And then, you know, entrepreneurs are hunkered down focused and, and um, you know, so we can, we can share information. Uh, we can create a certain level of transparency, predictability. And, um, and, and we can, I think we can help build, you know, if not, if not resilience, a certain level of like transparency and confidence around what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a mix though talking to people about whether they're you guys are still investing right now through the crisis you haven't sort of had to shut down things. Are you thinking about valuations differently? Yeah, we're probably being a little bit more thoughtful. I think the you know one of the things is it's harder to do diligence when you're not uh, able to visit an office and you know when you're not you're not able to you know, it's, it's hard to extract raw data even now sometimes because if it's a you know business that services restaurants or whatever those restaurants might not be able to provide the data. And so, you know, there's, there, there are a whole variety of different kind of challenges, but you know, we're still, you know, we're still, we're still active and we're very excited. Great. So uh, it, as far as just entrepreneurs in LA, it sounds like you're still open for business. Is there any distinction about what you guys focus on versus uh, like Sarah is also in LA? How do we know, like, does an entrepreneur know if they have a certain sort of company it's to go in this direction versus that direction? I think we're all like working together and like looking at different things together, but I think it's more of like, you know, how do we, how do we manage and, you know, we have, how do we manage the pipelines? How do we manage the portfolios? You know, if it's a software business, you know, maybe Kendrick out of San Francisco, for example, uh, is, is a good supporter. It's an open source business, you know, in particular, if it's a healthcare business and maybe it's Tron. So I think it really has to do with like, you know, just the ability to help manage and support that portfolio. Got it. And so I didn't really get too much of your guys' backgrounds. I don't want to miss out on that. I don't know. Where are you from? Uh, sometimes I ask, what do your parents do? Uh, how do your friends describe you? David, we'll put you on the spot. Yeah, so I'm from Chicago originally. So my mom is a public defendant in Cook County. And my dad runs, a, uh, he runs his own business. Um, and he has, you know, for, for as long as I can remember. Um, so I, uh, I stayed mid- in the Midwest for college. So I uh, went to Kenyon College in Ohio. Uh, and then immediately went out to San Francisco and uh, got into investing. So I was going to ask the, how do your friends describe you? Because I love that question. But really, I should ask Don, how do you describe David? David, how do you describe Don? You want to start, David, or should I? <laughs> I go for it. Uh, I mean, scrappiest hustler I know. How do we manage all these deals, Don? I, how do we find all these good deals? I feel like you've got to be pretty scrappy hustler in this business. It's, it's actually surprised me how much it is a scrappy hustle sales business. And Don, you're also Midwest, right? You're Minnesota? Yeah, I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> That's so cute. Does that make you nice? Are you nice? It's just like being from Canada? I think so. I try to be nice. I mean, I, I, I try my best. Tell me more about your background. What, what were you like in high school? I played a lot of video games. I love online games. Um, I sold enough uh, in the way of virtual items on eBay from a game called Ultima Online to buy my first car. David, I see you around a lot. Don, I see you in LA a fair amount too, which is exciting to have such such a good presence from GFC. But so I'll just wrap up and say thank you guys for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much, Minnie. This is awesome. It's so much fun. Thanks.